First draft that came into this country. Attention, please. Your attention, please. The College of Complexes shall now come to order. My name is Tim. I will be helping moderate tonight as well as Andy Anderson. I'd like to welcome all of you again because your continued support helps keep this, this institution up and thriving. There's only two rules that are mentioned that are required to be mentioned here, and one is one fool at a time, and the other one is no personal attacks. Uh, that's because, Charlie, that's what you've been preaching for years at this college. Would be hypocritical now. Introduce our speaker, David Wayne. From the, he's a, from the Zeitgeist Movement Advocate. It was founded in 2008. The Zeitgeist Movement is a sustainability advocacy organization which conducts community-based activism and awareness actions through a network of global regional chapters, project teams, annual events, media, and charity work. The movement's principal focus includes the recognition that the majority of the social problems which plague the human species at this time are not the sole result of some institutional corruption, scarcity, a political flaw of human nature, or other commonly held assumptions of casualty, of, of causality in the activist community. Rather, the movement recognizes that issues such as poverty, corruption, collapse, homelessness, war, starvation, and the like appear to be symptoms born out of an outdated social science. Let's give a warm and rousing round of applause to Mr. David Wayne. All right. Good evening, College of Complexes members, including program coordinator Charles Payak, videographer Tim, and uh, thank you for having me. And also, a warm welcome to any outside Z Day visitors that might be in attendance. My name is David Wayne, and the title of this day's today's talk is "Today's Zeitgeist: What You Can Do About It." I've got a lot of information to cover. This is going to cover in an hour. So you already know to save your questions and comments till the end, but I'm just going to remind you. Um, also, any bits of inserted editorializing are strictly my own and do not reflect the movement, which to its credit takes the tech, te tends to take the intellectual high ground and talk about the high level structural aspects that to me personally, Things have gotten so bad that I feel compelled to speak a little more frankly. So, let's go. Uh, today's talk is in six sections. First, a brief intro of myself and also the movement founder, Peter Joseph, uh, for some context and introduction to the movement and its understandings. Today's zeitgeist in two sections, as shown. Uh, three concerns or typical objections to the movement principles and the concluding finalism section. A little about me, uh, I graduated in 1976 with uh, honors with my Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. My career has spanned hardware R&D, software development, computer sales support, and these days consulting and contracting. I've always been logically minded why I became an engineer after all. And uh, in 2008, the logical train of thought presented in the Zeitgeist Addendum movie I saw online uh, kind of hooked into me, and uh, it clicked with me, and I decided to become involved first as Illinois State Chapter Coordinator when I still used to live here in Chicago. Then I freelanced several activist events in Orlando and the Tampa area when I relocated to Florida. And over the past several years, I've backed off to more of an advocate role as owner operator of SV Zeitgeist the Ambassador. And don't you want to know what SV stands for? It means sailing vessel. This is Zeitgeist Ambassador. She lies birthed in Palmetto, Florida, in the Tampa Bay area. I assure you this is not a Photoshop image. As one Facebook pundit quipped, it is quite real. It's a classic 1984 iron packet cutter rig, and I take her sailing in and around the Tampa Bay area every chance I get. I occasionally host events such as this Z-Day gathering on my boat. I have the mainsail partially raised to show the playful evolution graphics and its suggestion that the monetary system, symbolized by the dollar sign symbol, 
and the human slave labor for income racket, symbolized by the hammer, are hopefully destined for the trash bin of history, which we'll be discussing. And a little about Peter. Uh, the movement was founded by artist, filmmaker, and author Peter Joseph, and was inspired partly by the unexpected, unexpected groundswell support for his original 2007 Zeitgeist film, Online. That was the one that went viral. Now, even though Peter himself would be the first to modestly say the movement's not about him, I really have to give some just props here for his human dynamo-like effort since, he went on to make two more follow-on follow documentary films, Zeitgeist Addendum, the one that got me interested, and Zeitgeist Moving Forward. Note, it is emphasized, the movies are not the movement. They are Peter's own personal artistic expressions, but that said, they certainly shed a lot of light. He then went on to produce the hilarious and satirical Culture in Decline series, which were six half-hour segments online, basically poking fun at capitalism. And uh, last year, he then went on to uh, publish an uh, insightful book called The New Human Rights Movement. I actually have my copy right here. Okay, uh, it's a very good read. And over the years, he has done many hours of in-depth lectures and interviews online. And finally, we are all waiting on bated breath for his new film due out this year called Enter Reflections. Moving on, oh, I should tell you, here's a photo. I'm pleased, I, I had the pleasure and honor of meeting Peter in LA in 2016 uh, at one of his speaking engagements. We did lunch, and I can honestly say he's a very personable fellow indeed. Pretty laid back in my opinion, just a regular guy, but a brilliant guy nonetheless. Now, moving on to an introduction to the movement. Uh, in order to understand the zeitgeist movement, you need, need to understand the meaning of the word zeitgeist. It is a word like any other and happens to be of German origin. The term zeitgeist can be defined as the general intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of an era, i.e. the prevailing worldview. The term movement implies movement and change. Therefore, the zeitgeist movement can be seen as a social movement that urges change in the dominant intellectual, moral, and cultural climate of the time. Uh, found that in 2008, I think this was, it was part of the, uh, the, the intro, the, uh, the Zeitgeist Movement, or TZM for short, is a sustainability advocacy organization which conducts peaceful community-based activism and awareness actions through a network of global and regional chapters, project teams, annual events, media, and charity work, including Z-Day, this, in the spring, and also Zeitgeist Media Festival in the fall. And by the way, the uh, global Z-Day event this year is in Frankfurt, Germany on April 7th. Tickets available. The movement focus, the movement's principal focus, and again this is all gonna, also going to be a repeat, that is worth repeating. The movement's principal focus includes the recognition that the majority of the social problems which plague the human species at this time are not the sole result of some institutional corruption scarcity, a political policy, a flaw of human nature, or other commonly held assumptions of causality in the activist community. Rather, the movement recognizes that issues such as poverty, corruption, collapse, homelessness, war, starvation, and the like appear to be symptoms born out of an outdated social structure. We'll revisit that term. So, moving on to the zeitgeist movement tenets, the movement proposes a post scarcity global resource-based economy or RBE for short to supplant the present acquisitive neolithic rooted money-based economy which by any measure is destroying the world and everybody in it including you and me turning us all into wage slaves on hamster wheels along the way uh, you know Resources, by the way, being what people actually need to survive and flourish, things like healthy food, water, clothing, adequate housing, energy transportation, quality health care, education, and so on. And all of this in a world of true freedom without a price tag. Central characteristics of the proposed model as outlined in the New Human Rights Movement book right here. One, automation of labor, all around us these days, and in fact, relentlessly driven by capitalism. Two, access over property, exemplified by rideshare systems like Uber, instead of owning a car. 
vacation housing share systems like Airbnb instead of owning a timeshare or a second home. Three, open source collaboration. Ubiquitous Linux operating system from 1991 is the poster child example of this. And with open source endeavors kind of uh, expanding like Pandora's box ever since. Four, self-contained and localized city production systems. Starting with food and eventually hard goods using 3D printers in order to alleviate the completely inefficient and eco-abusive current practice of shipping foodstuffs and other resources across country or even further across oceans from other nations. Oranges from Florida, strawberries from Brazil, why don't we just grow them in that vertical farm right away? Yeah, I'll have it. Okay? Five, technological unification of Earth via a systems approach, meaning digital management, tracking, and distribution of all the planet's resources in a shared and equitable manner with the end goal of global abundance of for all, and there is global abundance for all. Scientists have known this for years. There's enough for everybody. Other attributes worth mentioning in a proposed transition from the present market economy to what RBE Earth economy would be. To replace wasteful, cyclical consumption of resources to responsible preservation of resources. Plan, uh, replace planned obsolescence with optimum design so things last longer, not shorter. Go from an infinite growth paradigm to a more rational, steady state one. Go from resource scarcity, artificially induced today, actually, uh, to relative, relative resource abundance, again, via intelligent management of them, with the planet, planet's caring capacity being the final arbiter. And finally, go from social imbalance to social equality. Putting it all together, then, a truly free society with adequate resources for all. Now, physically and technically, most of the componentry is already in place. But to understand how such a global RVE would differ socially, a comparison against the traditional isms, is in, uh, so to speak, is in order. Uh, First, we need to broaden the term economy beyond its present money soap focus into human management system, which is more what the word actually means in the management of a household in its green group, actually. Next, we title the columns across the top with the prevailing isms of history, be it capitalism, socialism, communism, monarchies of the past centuries, feudalism before that, the 8th through the 16th centuries, going all the way back to the ancient empires of antiquity, you know, Roman, Greek, Persian before that, the four Mesopotamian empires, Egyptian, all of them. The first thing to note with these, all these isms, is their standout common names, not denominator, of each employing their own money system. Uh, and so all simply repeat episodes of what we will call monetaryism, if you will. Uh, let me see. Adding one more call. Exceptional only in the mere technicality that it was pre-money and so used food itself or other exchanges a precursor, we will add Neolithic agrarianism, which is a man first learned how to farm, which pushes this chart's timeline to roughly 10,000 years back. Now, next on the left side, we populate with these not so much money-focused, but social-focused positive attributes in our human family-based household that we call Earth. Real quick, and, and, uh, huh? just I'd like to remind everybody just to please keep it, let us hear our speaker. There's been a, a general level of noise, you just like to hear them. That's all, please. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. All right. So, we've got our grid laid out. Now the tough part. We fill in the chart with the actual data. You ready? That's it. Okay. With the understanding <laughs> that a blank entry means the attribute is not present or the opposite is true. We see that all these isms do have repetitive labor or income or food. They do need money exchange or barter. Only the upper 1% is given access to most of the resources. They do have socioeconomic class stratification. They do not consider the ecology. And finally, they do all feature some kind of leader type as shown or other erstwhile babysitter equipment. Now, stepping back, uh, in summary, the, the chart looks kind of harsh, okay, from a social standpoint. And further, nothing has really changed in 10,000 years, for example, that 1% one per, one elite crowd. So why the seemingly overall selfish and inquisitive behavior over such a long span? Answer, starting with the emerging fixed Neolithic agrarian economies of the far 
This behavior combined no doubt with a little dysfunctional inbreeding at the top, <laughs> you know, with the top families, was conditioned upon all these societies over the centuries of Narnia due to a combination of geographical determinism and what is called socio-economic orientation, as the movement calls it, and that again is the perception, either real or imagined, of scarcity of resources, okay, fluctual, fluctu fluctuating seasonal crops, for example, crop yields, thus leading to the natural tendency of acquisitively stockpiling or hoarding them in an unequal fashion across the various communities, and later perhaps bargaining with them or fighting over them uh, as populations grew. Or geographically, the fact that the first great civilizations all grew up in resource abundant river valleys. Okay? Combined with this, because these first economies were agriculturally based uh, and labor intensive, it became a man's job. Thus, gender inequality and male dominance became institutionalized with women relegated to caregivers, childbearers, and lighter labor. Thus, the Neolog the Neolithic origins of acquisition, competition, property, profit, and inequality, with money developing soon thereafter as a corrupt usury exchange mechanism, with most of it going, of course, to the reigning leader for his wealth and his war chest, that society has been trapped on like rails and in chains ever since. This is the outdated social structure referred to in that focus slide earlier, also sometimes referred to in the literature as value system disorder. Now, clearing that little sidebar, returning to the chart with this perspective, across this broad time span, of course, there have been many facets of human technical progress, intellectually, scientifically, no dispute, but across these key attributes of human social progress, Okay, where this chart is focused, particularly the stubborn persistence of social inequality. By comparison, all of these isms of the past and present are relatively speaking social failures. Hence, our promotion of a post-scarcity RBE to alleviate this. Now, uh, if we populate this, finally, having the right side resource-based economy, we see a reversal. All the positive attributes are now affirmed, including yes at the bottom, no leadership, okay? As spoiler alert, we are perfectly capable of managing and leading ourselves without laws, police, a government, or babysitter president, as we are no longer babies. And while such an opposite concept on the face of it might appear to be counterintuitive, and thus some unworkable or impossible utopian pipe dream, from an anthropological viewpoint, nothing could be further from the truth. We just haven't gone far back enough in time. Widening the same chart in time from 10,000 to say 100,000 years back, which is the rough time span of the human species itself, at least in Southwest Asia, and even long, even older out of Africa, so that the time, the prior 10,000 years is now smushed or compressed all the way to the right there. Okay, it is interesting to note the success of the ancient RBE, or I'm sorry, the ancient egalitarian hunter-gatherer societies, arguably along with the success of the primitive RBEs they existed in, for an estimated 90% of modern man's timeline, equating to some 90,000 years at least. This is the previous zeitgeist of man's evolution, the pre-Neolithic resource abundant zeitgeist. And this is the proper perspective. The longer the timeline into the past, into ancient primitive was still fully developed homo sapiens man, same us. Physiologically, same brains, just a lot less smart. The more the notion of an RBE makes sense, and so is, in fact, that much more viable going forward. Indeed, not only has it been done before, it is, in an anthropological sense, the rule, not the exception. In this corrected view, to borrow the IT lingo in which I work, we are literally dealing with a 10,000-year-old failed system patch no. on the right side. And we need to back it up right away. Whimsically speaking, we kind of got too smart for our own bridges the moment we started staking out turf. And we need to hit the societal undo button, so to speak, or simply to simply return to a shared resource model, or as the great comedian Bill Hicks famously quipped, just end the ride. But this time, the next generation RBE will be modernized, global, and uh, a lot of my place in life.
Yeah, modernized global and technically advanced instead of the primitive and isolated instances, as in the hunter-gatherer past. Of course, easier said than done, and not the focus of this talk. Please I don't, don't ask questions. How are we going to get there? That's not the focus of this talk, and I can't predict the future. But just as basic understanding and awareness of the broader perspective is at least a start. It's a 90,000-year-old faint but positive geological imprint in each of our minds. Finally, let's move on. I had to get that background done. Today's Zeitgeist Part 1, Money and Profit. By the way, today covering, say, the last couple of hundred years or so, a minuscule time slice within the wider 10,000-year current Zeitgeist just highlighted, but still representative as monetaryism is still certainly in place with capitalism as its current episode. Capitalism isn't working, or at least to any sane person with at least half an ounce of human empathy would not appear to be working. Looking at these two self-evident and starkly contrasting images. Severe poverty is the root of the high mortality rates in the developing world, let alone malnutrition, disease, overcrowded living conditions, inadequate sanitation, and contaminated water. Nearly half the world's population, more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day, with tens of thousands of them, mostly children, dying each day due to starvation and preventable disease. So this is how literally the other half dies. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, why is this? Okay, but instead of putting you on the spot, as a thought exercise, how do you think a wealthy capitalist might react to these images? Say a successful CEO. If asked how the right side image relates to capitalism, the CEO might willingly say something like, wow, that's the epitome of capitalism at its finest, the customer consuming product until he explodes. Maybe I can make a frame enlargement of that image and hang it in my mahogany office for daily inspiration. And when asked about the left side image, the same CEO, in a completely nonplussed manner, might say something like, ah, oh, that doesn't relate to capitalism. Poverty and starvation like this, although unfortunate, are externalities outside of capitalism. Perhaps local charities can help. Okay. The point here is the sad reality that the corporatocracy, to use the general term as coined by author John Perkins, simply as a rule that only blinkers out that is cognitively dismisses all of these negative externalities that lie all around them in both global and local society. They have to, as in capitalism, any such empathy, even a hint of it, directly clashes with the wetless profit motive, which of course is an unthinkable heresy in that world. But then again, the ism isn't the problem. Both capitalists and laws by the red ownership class stick man, and thus owning the gun of power and control and the blue labor class socialistic man have a common denominator between them, which is that sack of money, the only difference being who holds it. As the capitalist is obviously in control either way, socialism versus capitalism is in fact a false dichotomy, a mere word game really, and in the end, but an inevitable, relentless money grab by the powerful lead over the working class laborers, always has been. Mostly veiled, but sometimes direct. For example, a blunt 19th century expression uh, the capitalist attitude towards the worker protest was this zinger from 1886 by railroad and financial baron Jay Gould when he said, I can always hire one half of the working class to kill the other. <laughs> Neither is which political party the solution, with all respect to the many candidates that use this very venue to tout their political genu uh, agendas, along with all of your political leanings in the audience. Arguably, I submit, the Republican versus Democratic Party at the national level is another false dichotomy. Neither side is actively working for the benefit of the rapidly disintegrating American class or other, other elephant in the room issues like, say, any real criticism of the ongoing rampant imperialist, American imperialist, uh, like military intervention in the Middle East. And many of the issues they are engaged in seem to be wars of attrition against the corporatocracy anyway, such as curtailing lobbying and lobbyists, mass incarceration, minimum wage, and net neutrality. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doug. Now, Democrats and Republicans, or Demo-publicans, as Peter likes to call them, even if originally sincere, ethical, and well-intentioned upon entering office, are eventually subsumed as rubber stamp actors of the corporatocracy agenda. This is clearly evident from the exposure of ex-drone President Obama perpetrating the exact brand of capitalist fascism and global militarism as his Republican predecessor, with Trump certainly following suit, already having topped Obama's entire drone strike count during his presidency. 
No, it really comes down to that sack of money in that previous slide, who has the most of it, where money directly relates to power and societal class. But why is that? What gives our fiat money that is backed by nothing so much value and hence power? Comparing the US dollar bill to say the monopoly dollar bill below may seem comical and even absurd, but is it really? The only difference between these two notes is your belief that one has more intrinsic value than the other, or, that, or for that matter, either has any value at all. To stir things up a bit, I am of the latter opinion. For example, the real absurdity here is to think that you can survive dining on only on plate pools of $20 bills every day, or instead of $20 worth of gas, you can simply stuff $20 bills into your gas tank and have your car run. It is the resources described earlier that have the real value to humans, with money being only the middleman, and a man-made middleman at that. Yet in today's world, today's zeitgeist, the more money acquired, the more power, because of both more influence over others and more control over the resources, which of course leads to that classic saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And money's corruption is as old as money itself. Pulling a relevant and succinct quote from first century Roman essayist and biographer Plutarch, the abuse of buying and selling votes crept in, and money began to play an important part in determining the elections. Later on, this process of corruption spread to the law courts, and then to the army, and finally the republic was subjected to the rule of emperors. Sound familiar 2,000 years later? <laughs> <laughs> See, the truth is, at the end of the day, money is just pieces of paper, or more recently, digital bits representing them. And the U.S. dollar bill is a piece of paper that the current power class has built a fake religion around called the monetary system. With currency being the god of this man-made money system, or at least god-like, complete with the requisite belief system, doctrine, and dogma, like any religion, created and controlled and administered worldwide by an elite cast of high priests called central bankers and dispensed through their temples called central banks. And this is no exaggeration. Considering, speaking of the ancients on the earlier slide, many ancient temples also in fact doubles as doubled as the places where the state treasure was deposited for safekeeping and with the temple priests doubling as, wait for it, lenders. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious. Actually, temples as banks makes perfect sense. As in early civilizations, a temple was considered the safest refuge. It is a solid building, constantly attended, and with a sacred character which itself made it turn thieves. So it's no wonder several of the early central banks even look like temples. <laughs> Talk about a psyop. Okay? So maybe it's not quite the stretch to first pay a thought that today's monetary system is, in fact, a man-made religion, as they all were, its latest rendition created in the depths of secrecy and justified by self-serving philosophical invisible hand mumbo jumbo dogma and it presently rules us all for the simple reason that we allow it to by maintaining our faith in it its money god being no more than the tall shadows perpetuated by its high priests while remaining ignorant of other viable and more rational alternatives in which to conduct human affairs, like, say, a resource-based economy, which has no need for money. The reason for this, as Economics 101 makes clear, and the dirty little secret of any economist right up to the Fed chairman, is that, in a setting of managed steady-state abundance, the price of any resource drops to zero and stays there which is to say the resource becomes free, and hence money, and barter for that matter, becomes obsolete. Thus exposed is the scam that it is when it comes down to it. All the monetary system is really good for is the profit it creates in a world of contrived false scarcity, thanks to our fat banker at the bottom. And what is profit but a veiled and insidious form of violence on an exploitation of society, invariably, perpet invariably perpetrated upon the masses by the same people that invented it, the banker establishment, along with the corporatocracy they serve and the ruling money class they represent. It is violence because in reality, it ultimately manifests itself as the theft of resources, property, and ultimately freedom itself robbed from the lower class labor masses doing the actual creation Okay, albeit indirectly and subtly. 
Okay, the one percenters don't create anything. Okay. So whether, oh, and profit also equals addiction, like crack, due to its timeless lure of getting something for nothing and the gain it creates, using the endless corrupt tricks bankers have created around the money system, such as interest, debt and the tenant foreclosure, the fractional reserve system that's built in inflation, and moving up to more elaborate schemes or scams, like derivatives, credit default swaps, and so on, and all the while behind the scenes corruptively manipulating profitable booms and busts in the various all markets they all operate in for even greater windfall profits. So, whether at the entry level, so to speak, an impoverished, despairing woman, perhaps driven by hunger, who over time just simply adopts a prostitute lifestyle in order to survive, or at the other end of the spectrum, like some Pac-Man gone berserk at the industrialist level and chewing through the whole planet's resources on a global scale, it's ultimately the same thing. Once addicted to it, in the minds of those afflicted with it, profit motive has no conscience. And so there you have it. The monetary system producing parasites and prostitutes for profit. <laughs> Part two, terror and war. And by the way, war being the natural segue from the previous section, profit, okay, as every banker and capitalist knows, uh, war is and always has been and always will be the most profitable business endeavor on the planet. To keep the public at large and forever confused, fearful, off balance, and never able to, never able to give the fake underlying monetary system the critical thought it deserves, the strategy of the elite never changes. Ruling class rule number one is always provide them with a fearful enemy, which of course they offer protection against for a price, of course, in classic Hegelian dialectic style, again with the ultimate price being our freedom. The reliable and timeless tool over the centuries for dispensing this rule is false flag operations. Actually, I think I can guess rules number two and three as shown. Rule number two, divide and chaos, a variation of the old Roman divide and conquer maxim, ideally across sectarian lines, as so prominently displayed in the Middle East for the past century, where importing factions are simply set up to fight each other. And rule three, always keep them distracted from the spread and circus in Roman times and manifested today as an insidiously dumbed down problem. As conditioned by Western mainstream programming, lame sitcoms, fake news, propaganda fear, the rabid addiction of Americans to professional sports, and so on. And on top of that, there's Hollywood, 99% of which it now produces are non-movies extolling murderers and thugs, myths and monsters, or combinations of both. Fast forwarding to today and getting back to rule number one, what is today's latest fearful enemy racket? Why it's terrorism, you know, communism being so 1999. And also now go, going back to the ancient high priest scare tactics of claiming godlike control over such natural events as lightning and thunder, volcanoes and earthquakes, solar and lunar eclipses, and so on. Hey, whatever fear scam works, whatever rabbit they can pull out of a hat. Okay? As hinted in the meme, such terrorism is fabricated out of whole cloth and perpetuated by the establishment itself with the U.S. and allied NATO forces as their sock puppets and the U.N. as the puppet master, front man. Keep in mind the term terrorism is an empty distinction designed for any person of real or imagined who chooses to challenge the establishment. And indeed, there is real and imagined terrorism in the world today. As a case study of real terrorism cut out of whole cloth by the state, to quote the late great but no less notorious is a big new Brzezinski, global geostrategist, architect of erstwhile poster child for the so-called New World Order, co-founder of the Trilateral Commission with David Rockefeller in 1973 as a direct result, and most recently former President Obama's top foreign policy advisor, quote, the Muslim terrorist apparatus was created by U.S. intelligence as a geopolitical weapon, thus confirming the very Middle East divide and chaos example I gave a couple slides earlier. It's a way to hold vast domains by smashing them up and the quarreling feet them. And the cheapest way to get people to fight each other is with religion. Okay? To highlight his, his crowning achievement in this regard, with Bush II calling Iran one of the axes of evil powers after 9-11, an Iranian Islamic fundamentalist ruler Ayatollah Khamenei calling the U.S. the great Satan back in the 80s, 
few observers noticed that U.S. intelligence actually installed Khomeini to subvert a popular secular revolt against the Shah, who was the previous U.S. puppet, puppet who had fallen from grace. Brzezinski did everything to overthrow the Shah and then to make sure that no secular politician uh, uh, or, yeah, took, took power in his stead. As a result, Khomeini's Iran did indeed become the propagation of fundamentalist ideology and is so to this day, just as Brzezinski had intended. And as a result of that, Iran is seared into the American and world psyche as a hateful, <laughs> religious, evil case you know, nutcase nation to this day, against which, <clears throat> again, Hegelian dialectic, the simple solution is war. This is the way to take it out. Another blunt, no doubt, NWO styled uh, quote of his is Today it is infinitely easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. Gee, how comforting, how heartwarming, how dark side. Okay, and by the way, back to that upper quote. What U.S. intelligence might Zabig be referring to? Why, it's the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Of course, history records that the CIA has manufactured and orchestrated thousands of armed insurgencies in dozens of countries around the world, arming bands of mercenaries and death squads in an effort to overthrow national governments and expand Amer American domination over every corner of the globe. Classic examples include Operation Phoenix during the Vietnam War, Operation Gladio in Europe, spanning decades after World War II, and the near-miss Operation Norwood, Northwoods against the U.S. itself in the 60s, invariably tying into the fake flag aspect, each atrocity is typically blamed by the Western media on the political opponent. For example, WMD blamed on Iraq, and Northwoods blamed to be blamed on Cuba, had they pulled it off. And by the way, note that quote up there is 30 years old. Imagine the numbers today. It's like the CIA is what? A legitimized mafia or something? Well, here's a classic quote by none other than legendary mobster Chicago <laughs> boss, Sam Giancana. The CIA and the mafia are one organization to keep a low profile while they control the world as a business. Well, that certainly would explain it. The CIA is a mob in a suit. <laughs> and here again, this quote is over 40 years old. And it gets worse. Fast forwarding to today, breaking news, okay? Uh, they are now just openly running for Democratic seats in Congress. They don't even hide it anymore, okay? Some of them even brag about it on their website. Well, so much for any hope of some future, you know, Bernie crap progressive. Now it's about war on both sides of the aisle that these guys get in. But I digress back to terrorism. Okay. Another more current example of terrorism, of course, is modern-day ISIS. Now, these days, it's all but common knowledge that the Islamic State, or ISIS, is made in and backed by the USA and its Middle East allies, an instrument of terror designed to conquer and divide the oil-rich Middle East in general, blending rules one and two. To check Syria and Iran's rising influence and solidarity in the region, and specifically to depose of Syria's President Assad, so as to free up the building of a key pipeline he's been blocked on. And yet, there's a fake side to ISIS, too. This Pentagon, okay, Pentagon outsourced project to produce professional grade and sensationalized, gory, but fake terrorist videos are the epitome of this. All such numerous staged ISIS and terrorist propaganda videos, which flooded the U.S. and British press in 2014, have a one purpose, to serve as justification for the entire U.S.-led intervention against the so-called Islamic State in Syria. Even Fox News reported that at least one of the ISIS beheading videos was likely staged in a studio. And as a punchline, it so happens, the same London PR firm was also paid to create fake Al-Qaeda propaganda videos during the Iraq War. To put both fake and real terrorism in perspective, fourth U.S. President James Madison first flagged the fake aspect some 200 years ago when he said, if tyranny and oppression come to this land, it will be in the guise of fighting a foreign enemy. The loss and liberty at home is to be charged with the provisions against danger, real or imagined, from abroad. Now, note how that quote reads just fine without the two underlined phrases. And yet Madison put them in there. Why? Because obviously it was happening back then and he knew it. Okay? His danger imagined our fake false flag terrorists. In fact, just the ever-unfolding same psyop over the centuries 
And doing only a slight segue here, what is war, the, uh, the terrorism, the real kind, with a bigger budget? And of course, with greater, greater carnage of wider geographies, and a verily consisting of higher death counts of innocent civilians, in some cases all the way up to full-blown genocide, yet somehow wars typically fought by the American and allied forces against so-called terrorism are different. They are somehow more righteous and honorable. Well, regardless of your personal feelings on that, it might interest you to know that either way, the elite don't give a damn about soldiers, okay? Uh, yes, from real politic, foreign policy mastermind and alleged war criminal Henry Kissinger comes the classic quote, military men are just dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. Sorry, I skipped forward too fast there. Anyway, summing it all up, uh, if parents were honest, I love this meme. I love this meme. Kid looks up, Mommy, why do we have wars? Because we are all ruled by an elite group of psychopaths who own the banks that control the governments and the media. They fund both sides of the war for profit and they manufacture the consent of the public through the propaganda of the media. Uh, and by the way, America has been, you like that, huh? America has been at war 93% of the time. 222 out of 239 years since 1776. Yep, war is good for the economy. Well, interpreted really, that means good for the money class. They're invested in the military establishment. I think this quote from the late Jacques Fresco uh, really nails it. Now, to pause here and do a quick side intro, Jacques was a self-taught industrial designer, social engineer, and passionate RBE advocate. Among his many lifetime achievements, he was the founder, along with his companion Roxanne Meadows, of the Venus Project in Venus, Florida, a 21 acre research center with futuristic structures designed and built by Jacques himself. There are weekly scheduled educational tours of the Venus Project, which I highly encourage. Following a brief joint collaboration in the early years, the now separate entities, TZM and TVP, continue to promote the same RBE concepts in their, both, in their own ways. Jock passed away last year at the age of 101, but his spirit lives on. Moving on to the quotes. If you took the profit out of war, there would be no war. What the hell do you think war is? You think we go to another country to bring democracy? We go there because there's oil, resources, or something we need. And a more recent quote, uh, so similar it's creepy. Chuck Hagel, former U.S. Defense Secretary and Senator, who would certainly know, states, people say we're not fighting for oil in Iraq. Of course we are. They talk about America's national interest. What the hell do you think they're talking about? We're not there for the figs. Yet, remember all the propaganda back then? Saddam and 9-11. Uh, no, they finally had nothing to do with it. Uh, Saddam and WMD. No, they never found any WMD in Iraq. Uh, nope. It was all about Saddam's oil all along, and all the rest was propaganda bullshit. And here is a follow-on follow 30-second follow sound bite from Jock himself that I couldn't resist from his appearance in the second film, Zeitgeist Addendum, which he puts human civilization itself into perspective in his classic, no-nonsense and blunt style, which to me is priceless, no pun intended. Hopefully you pick this up. Tim, can you can you help him out? Sorry about that. What? He's oh, trying to wait, play oh, you a know video. What? I might have turned it off. Yeah, you He's trying to play a video oh. and show the sound. Okay, hang on. Testing, testing. All right, what you need to do is. You can take it out of its holder. The mic. There's the microphone. Speaker right there. Testing. Oh, you know what? Okay, wait. We'll try. We'll try one more time. Got right to break this thing. Right. Try it again. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, get that? We're all pinheads. <laughs> okay, so summing up this portion of the talk. Uh, the, today's, and to, and today, remember, the root socioeconomic orientation here is scarcity. Um, let's see. Yeah, against ancient misperceptions of scarcity, a finite, re resor re a finite replanted its resources on the left, plus unchecked infinite growth, consumption, and pollution, combined with placing profits over people, leading to endless politics, poverty, and war, eventually ends up a weakened and possibly dying planet. Its resources plundered and its population subjugated and slowly decimated for all this fictional god called money and its endless crusade called profit. It's as if humanity is an organism in a war against itself for the past 10,000 years, which, to quote the late great astronomer Carl Sagan, the organism against itself is... People can't hear you. Tom can't hear me back here. Oh. Jet, jet. You got it, yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah, sorry. There, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, uh, uh, the whole idea of infinite growth is destroying the planet in a nutshell. And to quote great, the great, great astronomer Carl Sagan, an organism against a war against itself is doomed. We are one planet. So you see, the perception of scarcity over time becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now. Let's get into the concerns, at least assuming I still have your attention, instead of this current mess we're in. To kick off this section, this equally simple meme shows a global resource-based economy with the corrected root social orientation of true abundance, not misperceived scarcity. We start out with that same healthy planet on the left side, but intelligently managing, distributing, and sharing the Earth's plentiful resources in a steady state via modern digital and computerized systems guided and constantly refined um, by feedback mechanisms resulting in sustained and renewable abundance worldwide for all the planet's inhabitants. This basic just share theme is so simple, a five-year-old can understand it, but adults can't, per the typical following concerns. One, you gotta have a price tag. What will motivate people? Okay, even on the face of it, this objection strikes me as a bit disingenuous. A moment's reflection will tell you that money needed for incentive is a myth. One need to look no further than the organization Doctors Without Borders to grasp this, let alone all other volunteer operations where people can freely their time for a worthwhile cost. So, still, we'll address this concern in two ways. The first one offered by Jacques. The people have access to the necessities of life without servitude, debt, barter trade. They behave very differently. Now, you want all these things available without a price tag. Now then, you got to have a price tag. What will motivate people? A man gets everything he wants. He just lay around in the sun. This is the myth they perpetuate. When people have access to the necessities of life, their incentives change. You want to be a painter? Be a painter. You want to be an astrophysicist? Be an astrophysicist. The education would be free either way in a moneyless society. There are no more restrictions on you living your life to the fullest, and so you motivate yourself to pursue your own dreams, not incentivized by stupid money. To answer the objection a second way, let's play devil's advocate and come back with, well, I'm not motivated to do anything today. I want to lay around in the sun. Well, that's okay too. As automation would ideally be applied to replace the vast majority of human labor in society, chances are the present 40-hour wage slave work week would be replaced by, say, only a four hour a week volunteer maintenance like task in your community, if that, so leisure time, may become a much more pronounced feature in a post scarcity RBE society. In fact, an emerging social issue might well be too much free time instead of too little, to the point where the prevailing question in the shell shock society, so to speak, might be what, what do I do? Okay? Let's spell it out. If you had everything on the left, all your needs were met, food, water, housing, health care, transportation, material abundance, meaning a high standard of living, much higher than these crumbling cities and pothole roads that we live in today. 
energy abundance, access to technology if you wish, to tools, to education, true freedom. If you had all of that and everyone around you, well, how about some things on the right? Okay? Pursue passions, ideas, develop potential, self-challenge, develop relationships, collaborate with others on a project, travel, travel the world, explore, climb a mountain, discover, learn, you know, enjoy life, live life. Instead of the wage slavery and uh, other artificial scarcity bonds, feel, fears and uncertainties opposed by today's monetary system shackling you down. Moving on to won't work due to human greed. Here's that guy again. Jeez. Now, Hollywood conditioning and propaganda aside as a backdrop to the response to this objection. This gets a little deep. This is a cross section of uh, a cutaway view of the human brain, kind of a CAD drawing, the colored parts towards the base are components of the limbic system, which is the very old primitive fight or flight part of the brain from an evolutionary sense. This compared to, say, the more recent development of the prefrontal cortex on the right, where things like self-awareness, rational thought, and intelligence occur, with that very basic understanding. The notion that man is inherently greedy is also a myth. Morality or ethics, or lack thereof, can only follow from the social and environmental condition impressed upon each of us. You may recognize this as the old nature versus nurture debate. As it turns out, there is no human nature. There's only human behavior, which in turn is conditioned by the environment. Borrowing a succinct quote from Roxanne, you're not born with bigotry and greed and corruption and hatred. You pick that up within the society. And by the way, this is covered in great depth at the beginning of the third zeitgeist film moving forward. People use the cop-out phrase as human instinct or human nature simply because they cannot account, account readily for the behavior. The above and the rest of this response is lifted from one of Peter's recent lectures, which provides further detail in relation to the workings of the brain itself. Quote, if you generate a structure that creates culture of insecurity and fear like we have today, mainstream media terrorism being the perfect vehicle, you're going to excite older parts of the brain, the limbic system, the compound that are in effect primitive old primate reaction, such as competition, fear, um, uh, greed, violence, and apathy, and so on. However, if you have a structure in contrast that creates a sense of safety, fairness, justice, and security, you will bypass primitive brain reactions and excite areas of the mind related to higher order intellectual front, uh, functions, the prefrontal cortex, leading to a strong sense of trust, social capital, collaboration, empathy, and so on. On the parallel topic of morality, the existence of morality in humans and earlier primates is easy to explain in a purely naturalistic perspective, since social species have competitive advantages over solitary species, and genes that encourage cooperation and social cohesion are naturally selected for. Concern three, who will make the decisions? Now, let's face it. Of course, the biggest fear here is that in this supposed new society, we would devolve into some type of Orwellian technocratic big brother state where all decisions are made in secret by a small elite group and mouthed by our glorious leader. Society is reduced to some primitive, obedient, mindless, neo-feudalism worker class. Every action of every citizen is monitored and under constant surveillance, and thought police and jack boots can come kicking down your door at any time for any reason. Right? Okay, that's the biggest fear. In that case, all I can tell you is, can't you see this is where we are headed right now? From the new politely named but acutely invasive, smart net technology and appliances gathering data on your every activity inside your home, to Google knowing your every new web page and your browse history, your every location on your phone, Facebook, your very persona out on the internet, rampant unleashed NSA surveillance, NWO slash technocracy driven Agenda 21 and its genocidal death by sustainability plan and grand power usurping schemes and slowly but surely evolving an empowered police state. It's like sadistic, murderous Emperor Palpatine himself is smiling down on the unfolding progress. I repeat, can't you see this is the exact direction we are headed now? It's called totalitarianism, and this is what we need to remove from society like a cancer, not enhance it. Instead of this looming dark scenario, to the question, who makes the decisions in the global RBE, there are two complementary answers. Answer one, 
The answer is no one does. That is, no particular person with an agenda, such as politicians, by the way, all of which would become obsolete, corporate or national interests. Instead, decisions will be arrived at based on the application of latest technologies and first carrying capacity as the final, final arbiter. Again, computers could provide this information with electronic sensors throughout the entire industrial physical complex to arrive at more appropriate decisions with their applications and models regularly tuned, the use of the scientific method with input and refinement by all contributing specialists worldwide right down to the pertinent volunteer teams on a given local project. For example, the city system vision above cannot be built by architects alone, but also require cooperating this interdisciplinary teams, such as those shown here, those shown here, to, uh, working together globally in open source collaborative fashion. With the human element addressed, the second answer to this question is to automate decisions to machines wherever possible. Not only has this been happening all our lives, but these days it is accelerating at breakneck speed. Once the aberrant, corruptive element is removed, from a couple slides ago, there is no reason to hold it back. For example, the last thing I'd want to do is try to get between a teenager and their smartphone. But there's still a related concern here. Okay, pushback objection. What about some rogue engineer doing some evil programming and do bad things? Well, that is a completely valid concern. As Dilbert enlightens us, such scenarios typically start, though, with the government. Okay, I'll stop and just let you read this real quick. Go ahead, okay. It's the government that government coercion and propaganda in today's like this that leads to aberrant programming by otherwise honest engineer, along with other aberrant behaving individuals like, say, praised shooters, and sincere and patriotic, but no less, murder conditioned soldiers, not the engineers and scientists themselves. And the punchline is, if you resist, or worse yet, whistleblow, then you are branded as a traitor, or even terrorist, or at least out of a job, which is not an option for most wage slave engineers, just like the rest of us. So they do the aberrant programming they're directed to, all the way up to say, oh, I don't know, next generation AI drone strike projects spearheaded by, wait for it, Google. Okay, great. Let's make the controversial US drone targeted killing program that's already a black eye of immorality. Uh, you know, massacring thousands of innocents so far and actually creating more Mideast and African terrorists, even more efficient. And with zany megalomaniac Trump at the wheel, holy shit, double in Somalia and tripled strikes in Yemen, far exceeding Obama's record, which itself was huge. Man, sad, but that's today's zeitgeist. Whew, the final isn't. And wrapping up, I've got a treat for you. We'll kick off this final section with a video testimonial of a man who actually witnessed firsthand a moneyless and affluent RBE society in action. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Okay, this time I'm going to do it right. I'm going to hold it right up with the speaker here. And there we go. Okay, listen up. Yeah, I'll try one more time. Is the microphone on? It is. Testing. It's your speaker. Okay, this, this side was a little bit louder. Yeah, I'll just. Okay, I'll try it again. You know what, here, hold on. I'm going to try to just salvage this if I can because this quote is so amazing. 
I wonder why if my volume is not turned all the way up. Well, you can read it, sir. You can read it. Huh? You can read it if you want. Just yeah, yeah, you're going to have to read he it. He can't though. read. Yeah. Can you, can you read it? Can you see it? Okay, I'll read it. I'll read it. Here, let me get back. Uh, Jack Nicholson's character is saying as follows. Boy, that is quite faint. That's okay. okay, I'm still alive. Yeah, that's good. Right. Computer music? I, I, I really, I, you know, I was thinking of getting next other speakers, and I did. Okay, I'm gonna wait till he's done. Okay, they don't have no wars. They got no monetary system. They don't have any leaders. Each man is a leader. Because of their technology, they are able to feed, clothe, house, and transport themselves equally and with no effort. Okay, that's what he's saying in this quote. And his friends can't believe him. Okay, now, um, unfortunately in this classic clip, clip from the classic movie Easy Rider, Jack Nicholson's character was referring to his make-believe Venusian friends from the planet Venus, and not anything here on Earth, at least not yet, but it could be, because they're waiting for us, and if you chuckle this off as some inept and trite example, we'll be revisiting this very shortly in a couple of slides that maybe we consider. Because if we do nothing, the final ism that lies in waiting is totalitarianism, as I hinted earlier. To quote famed novelist George Orwell, author of the classic and chilling dystopian novel, 1984, no doubt the inspiration for this definition. A society living by totalitarianism is a society living by and for continuous warfare in which the ruling class cast have ceased to have any real function, but to succeed in cleaning, cleaning the power through force and fraud. Okay? Sound familiar? <laughs> Continuous warfare. Well, that historically 93% in America and counting, ruling caste. Well, that oligarch, 1% oligarchical relief that's been around for years, ceased to have any real function. Well, those manipulated and blowhard Demopublicans accomplishing very little real change, and then finally clinging to power through force and fraud. Well, that's the CIA, its mercenaries, death squads, and terrorist operations worldwide. Uh, and this becomes more obvious every passing year as this ongoing terrorism, fascism, militarism, and genocide become more and more visible on the world stage. So if the T world is too unsavory here for you, I'll stay within the present context of what we call it global <laughs> capitalism, or since America is effectively a global empire these days, halfway to this new world order thing, I'll call it empire capitalism. And the ultimate metric here, in plain sight to all of us here in America, is the annual budget figure in the gargantuan and ever-increasing share for the U.S. military over $622 billion in 2017, inch, and which, by the way, dwarfs other nations, China being $170 billion and Russia under $85 billion, and even the term military itself and its conditioned association to military defense, as in Department of Defense, right? Hell, at least this predecessor back in the 1940s was more honestly named the Department of War. And that's the point. Recalling again once more that 93% at war figure. It was never about defense. It is, has been, and always will be about military offense. That is war and terrorism, modern day. That's where all this money is going, or at least the vast majority of it. What you are seeing, maybe for the first time in this way, is the total necessity of global wars and terrorism to keep this empire capitalism afloat, which is to say, keep the monetary and profit titanic ship afloat, and we're already past halfway with the budget. So you may want to keep an eye on this figure in the years ahead. Oh, wait. Yeah, the U.S. military wants $716 billion for 2019. That's an increase of over $93 billion, or 15%. Suffice to say, the handwriting's on the wall here, and to cop that classic one-liner from shock, this shit's got to go. Revisiting Dark Side presents me one last time to sum things up. Uh, uh. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist this meme. 
possible, okay? It's possible. Probable is a different question, but anything's possible. And if you think this is an exaggeration or perhaps being mean to our dear old departed Zabig, listen to this quote, and hopefully this volume will be loud enough. Right up against the... Yeah. Yeah, I... Tim, how long are we going to go on here? Charlie, we're going to be done in a few round up. This is the last slide. It's not it's no candy. It's a bust. Uh, yeah. Newman Old Power is facing an unprecedented situation while the power is facing a unprecedented situation while the lethality of their power is greater than ever. Their capacity to impose control over the politically awakened masses of the world is at a historical low. Okay. Then he goes on to say, in that same soundbite, today is it all? It is ultimately easier to kill a million people than to control a million people. So, you know, this is what the big players are talking about. Okay, killing millions of us at a crack. So now I understand why. I think I'll say uh, I'll take my chances with that counterculture. You know. Uh, beatnik dreamer crowd. Uh, I'd rather be a live old hippie than a dead population redu reduction statistic. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's like the Star Wars movie has literally come true, but instead of Star Wars, it's Earth Wars. And this is a big guy. There's only one guy out of thousands of Empire players, past, present, and future, can't be bargained with. Working in their pure limbic system mode, move over Terminator, and while we silly ants play. These mundane capitalist versus socialist, democratic versus republican word games, the elite talks about the genocide of millions of us at a crack, but yet there is a glimmer of hope, buried right there in the quote, and noting that Zabig is at least acknowledging the awakened masses. Okay? So to the dismay of the NWO come Agenda 21, neocon, neolibs, zealots, and other false dichotomy, there is a disturbance in the force for sure, thanks to awakened free thinkers like us, as long as it lasts, and the internet for our communication. Okay. We're going to have enough to... Is enough? Yeah, this is the last slide. Okay. <laughs> Humanity's awareness and consciousness is rising. People are starting to get wise, and they know it. Uh, these people need thrown into straight jackets in rehab, not in jail. Use the Star Wars metaphor. A peaceful rebel alliance is taking shape with TZM and TVP leading the way. Other affinity groups like these show in the Free World Charter, Free Money Party, and also activists like Lee Camp and uh, the independent journalist Abby Martin, okay, which, uh, let's see, no, that's about it. Uh, yeah. All right. So well, you got to wake up. My final slide is my parting poetry to you. Now that resources are abundant, money is obsolete. Now that technology is abundant, labor is obsolete. Now that access is abundant, property is obsolete. And now that knowledge is abundant, fear is obsolete. If after all this, do you think a global-based, global resource-based economy, right. moneyless society, with all these positive attributes on the right and more, and a truly peaceful, prosperous, and free world just can't happen, but I believe and always will believe, it can happen. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'll pass out the DVDs. Okay. Andy, you matter we got about 20 minutes for questions to make sure that everybody gets Andy, in there. Tim's going to pass out the DVDs. I'll pass them out. You moderate the questions. I'm going to finish eating. Give me five minutes. Can you moderate for five minutes? Or Go ahead. Just, I'll uh, moderate. Do you want me to moderate? Point out. Go up and moderate, Karina. Just, just give me five minutes to no, finish we'll eating. No, we'll let Karina take care of it. All right. Yeah, you're just going to be answering questions and, uh, oh, okay. all right. All right. Questions, raise your hand. Right. Can't control it. Sir, in right. the orange. So, uh, let me just read this out. I put it together as I was listening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Caesar, by the way. I'm, uh, I wrote, well, I'm from the International Logic Party. Uh, I represent that in certain places, although not its ideas. This has to be a question, sir. The International Logic Party has no ideas. But, so, uh, how do you actually bring about this resource-based economy you're talking about? You had a one-hour block of all of our attention to tell us a lot of details of how this new system actually work, uh, works, but you did none of that. You did a whole lot of complaining. Okay. 
sure you gave us some really vague ideas, but I saw zero steps to actual realization. As far as I'm concerned, you're trying to sell us a pipe. All right, thing. thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. so he's, he's saying we, pipe two this is the problem, this is, but not talk about as I the said, mechanics. As I said uh, at the very beginning of the opening of the talk, and I emphasized it twice, the purpose of this talk is not to discuss the transition. The purpose of the talk is to describe today's zeitgeist. If the society would invite me back, I'd be glad to talk about the future steps. However, again, to repeat myself, I cannot predict the future, nor can anybody. Nobody knows exactly how this is going to unfold. It would be ridiculous of me to stand up and try to predict the future steps towards a resource-based economy. I see what you mean. Can I conclude my question, though? Oh, okay. Is it a question? Yes, I do have a question. Uh, so, not only that, I'd really like to know uh, for you to clarify how this resource-based economy is not a simply a fancy new name for communism. And then uh, the other thing is, furthermore, I'd like to check on one more question. Uh, what is the role of a market in this RBE economy? Personally, I'm firmly convinced that uh, that okay, a market. Okay. So, is this? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. That the market is the most fair way to, to relate uh, with some uh, with the value of goods that are uh, necessary for survival to, to the value of goods that are that make life enjoyable in a population of people. Mm -hmm. So does this RBE still give people the freedom to participate among each other using a market system? Okay. okay. Question number one is: Is the Zeitgeist movement communism? Right. Is it new communism? And does it allow the, for a market? The Zeitgeist movement is not communism. All of these isms have several things in common, going back to this slide. The first thing is they all have a money system in them. The RBE has no money. The second thing, they all have competition. And the third thing, they all have social class division of a rich elite and the worker masses. They're always fighting to get ahead. An RBE has none of those. That was the whole effort of laying out the groundwork in that you don't have, you know, I'll bring it up again. There it is, okay? Does not have repetitive labor for income, doesn't need money exchange or barter. People still have trouble with, well, if you don't have money, you gotta have barter. You gotta have something, you gotta be able to exchange. No, I'll give you a quick example. You've got two apples, I've got two oranges. You want one of my oranges, I want one of your apples. Okay, you with me? We barter one. I give you one of mine, you give me one of yours, so now you have an apple and orange each, I have an apple and orange each, right? That's an example of barter or trade. Yes. With me so far? Same example, different numbers. You have 10 apples and 10 oranges every day for the rest of your life until you're sick of apples and oranges. I have nothing. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, that's capitalism. Sorry, wrong example. <laughs> I have 10 apples and 10 oranges every day for the rest of my life until I'm sick of them. Question. What do we barter? What market is there? Answer, there's none. In a world of abundance, money, market, exchange, and barter, and all of it cease to exist because it's no longer relevant. The price drops to zero. Sir, I'm in the blue. If, uh, if uh, labor is obsolete in your uh, screen there, uh, how are you going to support all these millions of uh, unskilled labor that you liberals are bringing in? How do you want to support immigrants in your uh, zeitgeist-based economy? The, fir the first, economy. I would say the first goal is to get everybody fed to end the starvation of them on this planet of 10,000 people a day, which is just awful. Okay? And after that, the question is, get everybody stable, get their health needs addressed, see what they want to do with their lives, maybe put them up in temporary shelters until we can actually get regular residence for them, again, with a much higher standard of living. This is all going to take time, but eventually each individual person that stands to reason, if you just give them a chance to live, they will express themselves in what they want to do. How can I help out? If I can't help out yet, if I physically have no skills, then I'll have to go to school to get it. That's okay, education is free, okay? Let's say you have an immigrant and you got a toothache. Would you want an immigrant to work on your toothache? No, you want a dentist, okay? You have to have the skilled labor based on the problem at hand. 
everybody eventually pursues their own interests, whether you're an artist or an astrophysicist in that one slide. The education is free and whatever your little heart desires. But it's not going to happen overnight, especially for absolutely illiterate and dumbed down immigrants. It's going to take a while. In, in, in California right now, they're living in, in tents. Right. They got human waste in Los Angeles and, and hyper Jonathan, question please. What public policy in what countries on planet Earth in the 21st century do you feel best give the United States an opportunity to improve our quality of life and are something that you envision is sort of like the Zeitgeist movement that you described? What current policies in the United States would you currently recommend? I'm not quite sure. Is that the question? What public policies all over the world do you think best represent a good idea for humanity? Out of the whole oh, world oh, of the oh, current oh, oh. You know what? Some people keep track of this. I really don't. I heard that Iceland is trying their best to go. Oh, there you go. Iceland's trying to go on RBE. You know what? Uh, as long as as long as the, the monetary system exists, they will be squashed like a bug. The U.S. military will paint a picture that their their president is a dictator and he's got to be taken out because they don't want any society that they don't own the monetary system and they don't have a Rothschild bank in there. Okay, I wish Iceland all the best, but I I I, I, I don't know. We'll see. You know. Bob Lichtenberg, question. I can ask a question about most of what you said. It, most of it seemed like oversimplification to me. Uh, I thought you read it so fast. Right here. Um, it's not fast. It's fast. Do you have a question, Bob? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, you know. Let's hear it. Just take me a second, okay? Uh, well, I'll ask you the deepest one. You said for a, a Hegelian dialectic. Uh, the end is war. And, uh, I don't know what's your source for that, or most of what you said. Uh, so, what's your source for that? Um, you know, I guess um, Hegel certainly doesn't write that or say that. It says, Please get the to the point. The end is is union with God. He didn't say it's war. War, war is a low state of the dialectic for him. Well, look, I've, I've, I've touched on Hegelian dialectic, and I've read a couple of articles. I don't claim to be an authority in it, but the whole idea of a Hegelian dialectic, if you'll agree with me, is to invent a problem where nothing existed before, so that you can, you can, uh, or what they call uh, what, uh, synthesis, what, thesis, uh, sy antithesis. antithesis, and then synthesis solution. But it's all contrived by the elite just to try to steer society in the direction they want them to go. Okay? And it's always problem, you know, uh, uh, solution, and then new paradigm. And a new solution is usually uh, involves taking resources from the lower class masses who are actually getting the work done to, and, and, and uh, the higher class uh, people, um, you know, just uh, benefit from it. Questions. All right. All right. We got to move on to the next question. Ms. Ed Rios. I've seen, I've worked with a um, sociopath, and I have seen people who are child molesters and people who have murdered somebody out of jealousy. How does your work, how do you handle that? That, How do you handle criminal, violent criminals? That is a great question. We're not talking about questions or uh, 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 crime out of like desperation for money, which is 99% of it, but um, crimes out of passion. That is a whole separate area, and the best person to address an issue like that is a psychologist but, or a psychiatrist, <coughs> but probably the first step is to pull that aberrant conditioned person out of society and get them into rehab, okay? You don't want to throw them in jail. You want to get them under analysis, get to the root problem. Maybe as a child they were beaten by their father, you know, whatever. There is a whole section in the third movie from a Dr. James P. Gilligan, who was a prison psychiatrist, who literally rehabbed hardened black criminals for like 30 years. It was amazing. He wrote a book on it, and he said he couldn't, he said, I can't even, he said this on camera, I can't even describe the hideous things these inmates went through as children. 
that they were so torn up that they turned to life of crime. Okay? So that there's a big part of society out there, sociopathy and psychopathy, you know, I no dispute. Those are what we gotta focus on first. But unfortunately, the ones that are the most sociopathic and the ones that are the most psychopathic are the one percent elite crowd. <laughs> Questions. <laughs> Sir? Yeah, what about the same token? What about greed and selfishness, which is just inherent in humanity? How, how do you control that? There's a classic line, there's a classic line out of a, a book by Edward Bellamy called Looking Backward, and it was actually written in 1888. This guy literally had an idea then of what a future society could be without money. And the classic line in that book was, without wealth, there is no one to corrupt, and there's nothing to corrupt with. <coughs> okay. Once you eliminate the monetary system and everybody is fed, okay. again, go back to that simple example. You have 10 apples and 10 oranges. Really, that's not just 10 apples and 10 oranges. That's symbolic of all the resources you need in your life every day. Fresh water, food, shelter, clothing, housing, transportation. Why would you, and everybody else has them, why would you get greedy for somebody else's food when you have an abundance of food yourself every day? Some people just are. They just do it anyway. Oh, no, see, you missed that section. Greed is part of the limbic system, and if those actions, if those that part of the brain is not triggered, then you, you st you've got to use the front part of your brain, not the primitive fight or flight part of your brain. Neil, rest! Yeah. From the Bible and Plato to Machiavelli to, to, to Murray Bookchin, people have been thinking and analyzing about political economy for a long time. Which thinkers are, were most influential to you and to your movement? Who are the uh, most influential thinkers to him and to the Zeitgeist movement? Hands down, Peter Joseph and Jacques Fresco. All the rest of the philosophers, I don't want to diss them, but they all served their masters. For example, Adam Smith and his invisible hand uh, theories, you know. Have you read the Adam rise Smith? And Pardon me? Have you read Adam Smith? I have, I, I've read parts of it. I have not read the entire... Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Because the point is, he was serving the rich uh, banking elite to make them happy with his theories. Who were the two men? Please name them again. Uh, Peter Joseph and uh, Jacques Fresco. Uh, Can you spell Fresco? Oh, F-R-E-S-K-O. Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want to go up. Okay, go ahead, next question. All right, um, you have not had a question. I do now. Dave, yeah. <laughs> uh, Lenin said that uh, he would take all the gold and have it fashioned into toilets and put them in public restrooms for people to defecate on and urinate in. Uh, my question is, after the revolution in Russia, why didn't they have an abundance? Why didn't the well, uh, communist revolution in Russia bring abundance? Okay, uh, I didn't quite catch the first part of the question. We would take what and make toilets out of it? Gold. 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 Yes. gold, gold. That um, had said that boy, that, that gold, question, that, there, there, there's so many levels to answer that question. First of all, from a purely technical standpoint, that doesn't stand to reason. It's much more efficient to make toilets out of porcelain like we have today. Okay, so gold would have been a little bit of ego slipping in there. Second, if you, from what I have studied of the Bolshevik Revolution, the Communist Revolution, and so on, all of that is word uh, uh, play. It was nothing but, y yes, Trotsky and Lenin had some ideas and Marx and the, and, and the Bolshevik Revolution was an act, in fact, a contrived revolution by Western bankers. And everything turned into, all of the political rhetoric aside, it turned into a brutal totalitarian dictatorship under Stalin. The only reason that the Western media kept the terms communism and Chinese, well, both Soviet communism and Chinese communism in play was the simple fact that American capitalism had to have some mysterious evil guy foes to fight to justify all the expenditure of the military during the Cold War years 
50, 70 years ago. In fact, China and USSR were nothing but brutal, simple-minded, totalitarian dictatorships. And all of that wordplay about Soviet communism and Chinese communism was window dressing just to justify okay. that we're capitalists and we're the good guys when we're Americans and they're the bad guys. Ilana, Again, question. evil, every, you got to have a bad guy. Stand up, Ilana. I'm, no, okay, I Ask the question, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm no, a Union, and I disagree with what you said that right now. Uh, yeah, it's over there. Okay, so, okay. I, I would love to have a conversation with you What's your question, please? My question is, what's tomorrow going to be election? The question is, what does he think about Putin? I really don't care to give any opinion about Putin. I don't care to give any opinion about any politician because it just goes down the rack. <laughs> All right, questions, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Ellen. Okay, um, I have a couple questions. First of all, you seem to be saying that under this new system that computers are going to be making the decisions. So my question is, who is going to program the computers? Who is going to make the decisions about the resources that the computers are going to allocate? Okay, I can answer that question. How about you? Okay. How about you? But what if he disagrees with me? What if he disagrees? That's okay. With me? Uh, who is better qualified between you and who is the better computer programmer? Who is oh, demonstrated who, more confidence? Who is going to decide that? You, you can know. both be on a collaborative team. Whoever volunteers to be on an open source team anywhere in the world can input, and you can basically take a poll, very easily done electronically. You do them all the time on Facebook and so on. And out of the collective opinion, out of the acknowledged experts in a particular field, like that city of the future that I showed. It's like an engineer focuses, I'm sorry, an architect focuses on the architecture. You know, a sociologist so focuses on how will the people live in this new society. An environmentalist focuses on how are we gonna lay out the gardens in the circular rings of the city, okay? Uh, if, you're not, if you're not one of those, you might say, well, I'm not qualified to really give an opinion in any of those, so I'll leave it up to the other people. They will naturally, since they're not under coercion to do bad things, they will naturally want to come to a good decision. I've been an engineer for 40 years. I want to do the right thing in my heart, okay? I don't want to make devious decisions to make systems break. That'll get me fired, okay? Everybody has a good heart inside, just a lot of people don't know it. So Who has not asked a question? Who has not had a question? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, how do you, when I listen to you, I, I could believe that you were a Marxist talking about the end of days. You know, I, uh, how do you differentiate your your thing, your conclusion that uh, from those of a uh, idealistic Marxist? So how is how is the Zeitgeist movement different, or your conclusions different from that of an idealistic Marxist? Marxist. Uh, Marxism and communism with it have three components. They have money, they have competition, and they have labor, human labor. An RBE has none of those, nor does it have class division, nor any other of the attributes that I pointed out. An RBE is completely opposite of anything else, any other ism for the last 10,000 years. That's why I put up that original slide even though it was difficult to plow through. Only the RBE had check marks all the way down. No money, no labor for income, no socioeconomic stratification. All the resources are shared across all of the population. No leader or president, and we preserve the ecology. Marxism does not subscribe to that. Capitalism doesn't subscribe to that. So okay. Final question, Mike Lee. Oh, just a quick special announcement. Boy, all around, beat Tennessee. Yay! <laughs> all right. It's time for one more question.
Sergeant yes. Margaret Aguilar. On what, uh, do you have any source or basis for declaring that we have enough resources, but they're just maldistributed? How do you how do you justify saying that we have sufficient resources, but they're maldistributed? That is a very fair and honest question. Uh, I read an article a long time ago that scientists have known for literally 50 years That's that there is plenty of resources on the planet for everybody. They are just being deliberately held. I don't have the exact answer at my fingertips, although I do pull up a lot of references in this slide. But there are futurists such as R. Buckminster Fuller and Arthur C. Clarke back in the 19th or 20th century that said the same thing. There's enough resources for everybody on the planet. And a lot of them are just being held back by the corporates to force people into paying for, say, bottled water and let instead of tap water. We'd like to thank our speaker, the right question and answer. Right away, we wrote to you. We got more than half an hour for rebuttals. We are going at about 10 minutes till Charlie to. Uh, this is the time we start rebuttals. This is normally the time, the time we start rebuttals. Why are you rushing through this? You let them talk for an hour? In a half, and now you're rushing through it. Yeah! Woo! Yeah. 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 More questions? Yeah. Do you want to have enough time to talk? Yeah, another 10 minutes. Under my, uh, uh, under, according to my yeah. understanding, under communism, idealistically, that, or ideally, there would not be money. And that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah, How about a proletariat? Yeah. How about a 1% elite? How, I mean, the, 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 the stereotype of communism, if I'm not mistaken, is just worker bee masses right. at machines with their heads down, like, you know, in some neo-feudalistic condition. And that's the exact opposite of what we want to be. We want people to be free. No, sir. Uh, okay. As I understood it, under communism, it would ideally, it would be a system where everybody took out whatever they needed and right. put in whatever they made yeah, that was so, over and above right. what so they needed. According to who? According to a 1% elite that oversaw everybody okay. under the probably the uh, uh, they under, never under said control. That. Okay? It, the communism never, I don't think, claimed to be a, to be a leader of the society. Okay. Uh, I, I, I would take issue there, but I don't, I'm not a student of communism per se. Another thing about communism is there are so many different flavors of communism, depending on if you're in the old days with Trotsky and Lenin, or if with, with Marx, or if with, with Stalin. So many different flavors of communism. You know, you have to really define your terms. There. The, the uh, best test. Yeah, over here. Does she have a question about direct democracy? I, uh, she's not paying attention. Um, she had a follow-up question about direct democracy. Could you uh, state your opinion on that? Oh, is this what we talked about several weeks ago? No, no. We, you want I already brought that up just now. And, and, and um, yeah. did you not? Yes, I okay. did. Could well, I'm sorry. Could again? you repeat the question? Yeah. Well. Um, what I was saying was, if you have a thing where all these people are voting and stuff, that's a form of the direct democracy, it seems like. If they're voting, all the people who deem themselves or God or something deems them to be experts or knowledgeable in this field, um, or they'll just do it out of the goodness of their heart, they deem themselves knowledgeable in the field. Right. Um, those people, it sounds like you're saying they're going to be doing direct democracy and voting on these things. No, well, okay, you have to define voting because the traditional polling. definition of voting polling. is polling. voting for a politician. In an RDE, well, their politicians are obsolete. They are the word voting. polling refers to voting. Polling okay. and voting are kind of synonyms. Okay. okay, all right. So it would be, like I said earlier, whoever cares to step up and, and volunteer their yeah, services. Imagine 10,000 architects stepping up to, 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 to design one city. You wouldn't need that many. I mean, literally, there'd probably be some type of, of volunteer system put in place and say, you know what? We had a lead for 10 or 20 smart architects at best. You're number 150 on the list. 
thanks anyway. You, Go on vacation. Okay. Come back in a year for the next city project. You have to have someone deciding. You have to have a body okay. deciding. Yeah, but, who are those 20 of the best? Or can this not make You know what? You, you, Nothing you, can be perfect. I suppose there'd be you a little see, trial you, and error. You're, you're, but you know, the, the end result would be how good is the end construct if they make the city of the future? If it comes out great, then they did a good job. Right. If they screw All right. Okay, I, I know. Pick someone else next time. Next Let question, me. please. Uh, who wants to give her a bottle of more than one minute tonight? I didn't get a question. Oh, hold on, hold on. Hold who on. Who wants to give her a bottle of more than one minute or two Wait, minutes? Charlie gets a question. Okay. I know. Well, what but the hell is, who's you're, running this guy now? Yeah. If we're going to jump through a bottle, let's keep Charlie. Let Charlie, me talk, Charlie. If we're going to jump through a bottle, period. If we're going to have a rebuttal period, who wants to give a rebuttal? And then we'll go on with questions. Let's get a count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We got a dozen people that want rebuttal, so it's going to be three minutes apiece, and this will be the last question because we're running late on time. We're, we're going to cut this off at quarter to nine. Is everybody clear? We got to be out of here at quarter to nine, so last question now, and then we'll go to rebuttals because that's what the time shows. Okay. Okay, okay um, Charlie, your question. Charlie, yeah, you're the you last began, question. Dave, by talking, you didn't, saying you didn't want to import oranges from Florida and every couple every day there's a juice train that comes up and you want apparently you want to grow an orchard under glass or something you want vertical green houses? vertical farms sure wait a minute you and want you want orchard please. replace the orchards of Florida and build acres and about acres of under glass, I guess? Well, yeah, yeah, but the exact opposite would be true because vertical farms, by their very nature and design, go up like skyscrapers. So the last thing you do is take up real estate. In fact, you free up all that real estate and turn it back to nature instead of plowing it under for orange grows. But or, or, you know what? Florida can still keep their oranges just to do just to work with a You want to have a high rise? Orchard? <laughs> exactly. Haven't you ever heard of vertical farm? You should Google how vertical high, charts. How many Tell buildings and how, in, how many stories all over the world. to give us all oranges in Chicago? Right. You could probably plant, I'd say, you know, one every, geographically one every, say, I don't know, pick a number, 10 square miles. Okay? You would size the population. You would see how much the, you would actually study to see how much fruit consumption occurs. How much vegetable consumption? Okay. So you have an estimate. It's just the same way as designing a highway. You got to see how much traffic. This is energy. So it's an it's an engineering project. All right. Let's. Uh, I'm going to cut it off. Let's change our speaker tonight. We have something to say. Come up with a Okay. Thank you. By the way, there's some links up here if you want to just snap a photo of it. Okay, we'll leave them up. Let's turn off the projector. I will be giving our first rebuttal. Somebody please join me for three minutes. I can do that. Okay, go ahead. Let's thank again our speaker. I thought it was a very well thought out speech. Uh, I don't exactly agree with him, but we do appreciate a well thought out speech. Oh. 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 Okay. Is everybody ready? Again, I do apologize for the kind of somewhat rushed, rushed thing tonight. We have a lot of people in here, and we're going. All right. When we're ready, I will bring you to order. I think our speaker and his ideas are simply dead wrong. <laughs> One bull at a time! I think our speaker and his ideas are simply dead wrong. We have enough problems with trying to do central planning already. We already have a mechanism that works. It's called the supply of pricing and demand. Prices act like a traffic signal. If you see people buying more bread, bread gets more expensive. Therefore, they make more bread to supply the demand. 
It's a simple system with mechanisms. Do you mind handing Second, who is in control? A lot of times we complain about the, uh, my, the, the elite of the world. But I'm also here to tell you that in the last maybe 100 years, the human condition has gotten much, much better. World poverty has been reduced by quite a bit. Absolute world poverty, where you're living on less than a dollar a day, versus 300 years ago, where was, everybody was like that, except maybe the prince. Our technology levels have been rising. Abject poverty has been going down. Lifespan has been longer. If you don't believe me, I'd like you to take a look at the work of, he's a Swedish economist, Johan Norberg. There's a book out, it's called, uh, it's called, I'm forgetting the name of the book, but he's out and he's saying that we are spoiled brats when we are actually living a lot better lives than we've ever done before. And he does it and he can prove it by statistical evidence. I'll talk to you about it later on, but it sure. is a good, it is a good, I, have, I see you, sir, are an honest man and you want to try to look in. I'd like you to take a look at it. Thank you very much. Okay. I would like to thank our speaker for uh, trying to cram 200 pounds of potatoes into a 20 pound sack. Uh, I've watched the, the Zeitgeist videos over the years and the society he described, if you want to watch videos, popular, uh, what he's describing, where everybody has enough food, clothes, uh, fresh air, water, is on uh, Star Trek, The Next Generation. They described exactly what it would look like when people go to work today, or work in their uh, choice of uh, whatever they want to do, uh, you know, become a musician or an artist or an engineer. They do the work because they like to, because they're not involved in the day-to-day -day quest for uh, survival. Many of the problems he talked about solving uh, are on or talked about on the website Common Dreams Every Day. That's the best news site for unpolluted, no advertisements, talking about people recognizing the problems we talked about tonight and working towards solutions. My own personal opinion is that if, we, if you have a, a bad cut, you go to the emergency room, you can't talk about developing a, a blood clotting agent two or three years from now. You have to sew it up now. And right now, uh, there's a movement all over this country to try to avoid try to avoid, uh, you know, getting criminals re-elected. Uh, a kind of a criminal swamp is descended on our White House, and uh, it's more and more evident to everybody as we go along that something has to be done. So I would say, you know, support good people all over the country that are running for office. They would be open. A lot of these people are talking in exactly the same terms you, you have expressed, but within the current system. Uh, you know, universal health care, basically free health care, free education. A lot of, that would be a stepping stone. Support the good people that are trying to make a difference now. Don't tell everybody, don't vote. If you tell everybody don't vote, your vote doesn't matter, we get more billionaire predators centering on the White House and our Congress that will push us to a totalitarian state where it won't matter. People won't be able to do anything. So I would say there's a tremendous amount of hope. People are doing good things all over the country, but the media doesn't cover it. So uh, if anybody wants the information, I'll be there in the back after it's over. We're going to cut this off at 20 to 9 tonight and move out so that they, they, want, they want this area to be cleared by okay. the order to the restaurant. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next yeah, speaker. Boy, Andy. All right, Andy. All right. Six. Um, after the um, Second World War, we had Dean Acheson, who was Secretary of State under Truman, give a speech to the bankers and the industrialists. Essentially what he said was, we have to have an economy based on war, otherwise what will happen is, a Great Depression will hit us, 
and we won't be around too much longer. It's gonna get done. That's okay. So we knew at that time the ruling class already had an enemy at his disposal in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union didn't com didn't fail completely. If it did, they could never could have beat the Nazis during the Second World War. And the Lenin, when he first came into power, didn't think that the Soviet Union would succeed at all because it didn't have an industrial base. And socialism is built on an industrial base to begin with. Well, of course, we know what happened, it fell apart, and they made tremendous amounts of mistakes. But mistakes could be overcome if you look where the mistakes come from, and you can overcome it. Now, we have China and Vietnam. Just recently, I was listening to the BBC, and they said China is increasing the amount that workers get from about a hundred dollars a year increase. And it had the weakest and more or less undeveloped economy when it first had its revolution. Now it's the second greatest power in the world. So it's succeeding, but slowly. Vietnam had about 80% poverty rate. It's now about 20%, so it's increasing. If we look at the United States, they tell us it's about four and a half or 5% unemployment, which really doesn't mean anything because certain people, the majority of right. workers, don't get paid very much. So they're very poor. It's about 70% of the people in the United States don't have a living income. They have to work two or three jobs just to get by with meals and to pay the rent over a yearly wage that they get. Okay. So it isn't succeeding. The capitalist world is dying. And we could take different countries where you see it's dying. And I think socialism has to take its place. All right. All right. Yay. Take your head wrong. I discovered this under my bed this morning. I'm not going to read it all, but bits and pieces of it from 2017. Forecasting a Trump storm. The National Political Weather Service has issued the following long range prediction for the following months. Early January should see continued stable conditions with high probability of responsible government. But by the third week, however, look for a giant hot air mass moving across the United States, bringing with it a large orange cumulus cloud and extremely unsettling conditions. But beginning in late January and early February, we're predicting heavy snow job blanketing Washington, D.C. Previous forecasts of revived American greatness will likely only result in severe periods of deregulation, significant tax cuts, and the higher elevations. Congress will experience higher than normal levels of Republican hypocrisy. This in turn will produce Democratic cold front ensuing a frosty uh, in, in both the House and the Senate and a persistent national depression. Um, our agency will continue to monitor this national uh, and global meteor meteorological situation. However, we see little chance for the calmer weather patterns in the near future, politically given the current cultural winds with the limited possibilities of a change in the White House occupancy. Uh, this is something that you may know about. Uh, the National Public Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It's an agreement among the states, groups of states, and the District of Columbia to award the representative electoral votes to whoever wins the presidential, whoever wins the overall popular vote in the United States, in the 50 states. 
the compact is designed. So right now, the right now, the ten states are a part of this. Uh, there could be more later on, but basically, seventy-eight percent of the Democrats and sixty percent of the Republicans, seventy-three percent of the all, all, all in favor of this. So regardless, you don't have to get rid of the electoral college. All you have to do is agree that whoever wins the majority of the, of the votes on the national election, that will be our new president, not this guy that's in there now. All right. Um, thanks so uh, much to the speaker, especially for the DVD. I'm a fan of DVDs, so I'll be uh, happy to look at that. Uh, I am worried about the country. I am worried about the world, what's happening to people. Uh, these are all concerns. My own concern, hey, I'm 80 years old, what will happen in the rest of my life? But for at least the last 20, 19 years, I have had everything the speaker has talked about. I got a great place to live. I never worry about money. I've had a check every month since 1964. Every month since 1964. I got health care. I got dental care. I got a safe place to live. I love Hollywood House. So there are a few people who have already got what the speaker is talking about. What about the 99% of the people that are left over? That's most of you here. Uh, join with me and others on working on this problem. I've worked as a volunteer, no money, since 1999, 1998, the end of 1998. So let's work for the world that the speaker is talking about. Yeah. All right. Look for the world. Uh, you know me, Doug Binkley. Um, what the speaker was talking about was something science fictional that uh, I, back in the 60s, and he mentioned Arthur C. Clarke, I read Arthur C. Clarke, and the people talking about it, and Isaac Asimov, it was some of that too, of a utopia. And there many things written about utopia. So we really don't have time to discuss that. We have to really discuss the current issues, and uh, Andy Anderson talked about that. Um, we have uh, a problem where we have one of those psychopaths uh, at the top and a whole lot of psychopaths uh, in the, you know, the mid-level just underneath them. <laughs> and uh, we have to worry about a problem with these elections. Now, if you say that people shouldn't vote because, oh my God, there's no difference between the Democrats and Republicans. We've been over this again and again. There is a difference between the Democrats and Republicans, especially now. And even if you don't care, about the fact that, uh, well, you should care about the fact that um, elections can be hacked. The last one might have been hacked. In fact, uh, they might have been manipulated since 2004, at least. Uh, there's good evidence of that. Um, I have a book in my bag over here called Code Red by uh, Jonathan Simon. You can check it out sometime about the so-called red shift, about the exit polls indicating that Kerry won the election and then suddenly we found out that George W. Bush won it when the manipulated vote was counted. Now, you want to make sure that the votes are counted actually as they have been cast by the people. That's very important to all of us, should be important to us, if we're patriots, if we care about our country, if we care about ourselves, and if we care about not being governed by monsters and plutocrats and psychopaths. So in order to get to the zeitgeist or any kind of society that even resembles the utopia, we've got to get out of the mess we're in. So you've all, uh, most of you that have been here frequently have, have seen Dr. Laura Chamberlain. She's given talks here before. Um, they've been about various things, consumer advocacy and things like that. She's really concentrating on this electoral reform or this electoral accounting, accountancy, being able to account for your votes. We need to go towards elections like they're having in Canada and they switch to in France and other countries in Europe where there are paper ballots that cannot be hacked, they cannot be changed, um, 
and that they would sit there and, and be able to be recounted forever if necessary if you have to find it. But the best thing is to count them by hand at the time of the election so you get a proper count, you know exactly what you get. Now right now they're not doing audits of the uh, ballots in Cook County. So if you're registered in Cook County, either the city or the suburbs, we need you to be part of Dr. <laughs> Laura Chamberlain's uh, recount uh, demand that the that paper ballots be recounted by hand, not just put through these optical scanning machines. It's very important that this happen. It's going to start happening March 22nd after the election. I want you to sign up as a personal favor to me. I'm going to be going around, and please raise your hand if you're willing to sign up to devote right, right. a little bit of time to making sure our democracy can be accountable. Your time's up. All right. right. Yeah. Who's going to yeah. who's going to sign up? Hey. Head around. Uh, Thanks, David, uh, for your talk. And uh, I agree with a lot of your critique of uh, the current economy, current politics, current society. Uh, I appreciate that you mentioned the false flags and the divide and conquer strategy, uh, how terrorism is being used to promote fear, the role of the CIA. You said a lot of great stuff. Uh, but I think that a lot of uh, people have a, a correct critique and that it's rather utopian uh, to talk about all these things um, and not uh, mention or to not really elaborate on polit political institutions, uh, institutions of government. Uh, those institutions are what, uh, how you control, okay? What you propose is, is um, no one, at one point you said no one will, con will control, literally that's what you said, another time you said that a decision will be automatic, uh, and, and relegated to machines, that is, uh, as some people have said, I would say unreal. Uh, so you have to uh, ask how uh, everything's going to work, and that's what government is all about. Um, now, socialists and communists and anarchists have said a lot of the stuff that you've said, but they have also avoided the question of governmental institutions, and that's been a great failure of theirs. And when you don't uh, address the problem of government, what you end up with is dictatorship. Because somebody is going to rule, all right? Um, and so Lenin can, as one gentleman said, I think you uh, can, can promise gold toilets, okay? But somebody's going to have to control the economy to bring that about, if they ever do. And so you're going to have, uh, in the case of communists, uh, dictators. Um, so I uh, believe in an ism, and that's democratism. And I have uh, many times here uh, proposed that we have a direct democracy with community assemblies as the uh, legislative uh, component and an executive of uh, random sample uh, executive council. Uh, so we do, I think, have to address the question of what kind of government we have, what kind of government we should have. That is, to me, key to the solution of the problems that we have today. Thanks. Can we try to keep the noise level down so we can hear the speaker, please? Thank you. Yeah, there's a parking lot if you'd like to not listen to the speaker. <laughs> okay, so listening to this talk, and this talk had nothing to do with implementation, and I brought up the question about a psychopath that I had dealt with. And then what I wanted to bring up now is like the nature of human beings. So here we have humans, those of us in the room, and they left Africa however many, 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 many years ago. Okay, and they traveled. And a group of them entered Australia. Australia was without humans. And they grew and grew. And within a thousand years, all of the large animals in Australia were extinct. And then a group of humans entered the North American continent. And in North America, we had mammoth, we had camels, we had horses, we had saber-toothed tigers, giant sloths, and within a few thousand years of humans entering North America, all of them disappeared. And the idea that human beings are wonderful people is so foreign to human nature that I just think it's just fantasy. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the first thing is, is that. Uh, All right, let's give our speaker. Hold on, Margaret. Let's give our speaker the opportunity to be heard. Thank you. Okay, go 
Okay. Uh, the first thing is is that, uh, that recent discoveries push back Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is a species to 300,000 years from recent discoveries in Africa. So this agriculture, which really marks the first major departure from a hunter-gatherer society, only happened 10,000 years ago, and we know that it happened in, in the Middle East as well as in China about the same time. So this uh, agriculture and, and uh, that development into urbanization and then now whatever it is that we have going is really just a, a blank on the end of the scale. But we're managing to, to destroy the world as it is. Um, the second thing in terms of your, uh, the basis of your thing is that there'll be enough resources for everybody and you don't satisfy me with your citations, to say the least. And Buck Mr. Fuller is not a biologist. E.O. Wilson, however, is a biologist. He's internationally known and he said it would take the resources of five or six Earths for us to support the population at, at uh, all of the population of the Earth. At, at a level that Western society would consider acceptable. Mm -hmm. So this means that any that, that the development that we have now, our ability to utilize resources and to create food or whatever, is not sustainable. So, um, so I think that, that that is a huge flaw in what you're saying. You don't have you don't have scientific citations to demonstrate what you're telling us, and people who are actual scientists are saying, no, that's not going to work. All right, All right. Three minutes. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, I love this free speech forum. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I know, um, you know, I'd heard great things about this zeitgeist idea, and I hadn't heard of it. But I agree with it uh, wholeheartedly. It seems like it. It's kind of I intuitively have always questioned. You know, it sounds like why not utopia? You know, Plato, Socrates. John Dewey, socialism makes sense to me. And my theory, you know, at the, as I look back on life, is that the uh, right wing in my stepfather, for one, always taught me out of it. It won't work, you know, negative. And um, I always gave my power away. I'm like, oh, you must know more than I do. That I learned later that's like an external locus of control, obedience to authority, continuing to let other people nix it but uh i really it, i think it would work you know and since really the last 10 years since all this uh yeah i've noticed maybe 20 the you know this fascist takeover of the country um it's uh i realize you know you experience not having rights that that that's uh it's been those people kind of the deep state covertly hidden that have always uh, you know, my step up, no, you know, you're just wanting utopia. That's what they said to the, uh, about the socialist, um, you know, starting in 1918 or whenever this uh, kind of plan, this coup d'etat, the new world order to take over things. So uh, it's, um, you know, we just have to stop listening to this continual disinformation and uh, be vigilant, kind of, you know, like they were when they invented our country. Uh, you know, um, Jefferson and you know, Franklin, right? You know, vigilance. And uh, it, it could work. You know, John Dewey talked about that too, and Jane Addams, that it's like in a classroom, in a school, in a community. You get along. Your culture is what influences you. So I, I love your arguments, and I'd like to hear more about it. How does it, uh, where's it worked, and who are these people who invented it? So, I got it. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah, it seems to me this guy's got an answer. Uh, he's got an, an argument. He's got a, a way around whatever question you refute him with or with whatever argument you have to refute him with, he's got an answer. But if you finally pin him down, he gives you, well, it's not 
about reality. This only is a theory and, and doesn't really exist in reality. I think anybody that would buy into Zeitgeist needs their head examined. And I think the guy that uh, has presented the thing tonight doesn't have one to be examined. <laughs> Okay, um, hello. Hi, my name is Ellen, and I want to make a few comments. You may um, So I, I think it's a very kind of nice utopian ideal. It sounds kind of like heaven or something like that. Um, the, uh, there are some problems, though. When you make a presentation, you have, in order for this movement to do anything, it has to be extremely much more thought out. Okay, there is no, there needs to be political institutions. Let me give you an example. You have this idea that the computers are going to make the decisions. Somebody's got to program the computers and decide what um, perimeters the computers are going to say, oh no, we can't do this because there aren't enough resources. There's got to be people deciding that. The pro one of the main problems with your, your theory is you have this idea that nobody is making the decisions and everybody who wants to can make the decisions, but you don't want to say it's a direct democracy, you don't want to say there's voting, but you want this to be kind of an ethereal idea of of an entity out there making the decision. No, there are people, there has to be people behind these decisions and you have to figure out who are those people going to be. Okay, another major problem is, um, and, and actually I was speaking to Bill Ford about this a little bit, you know, the, the idea, you gotta have at least barter or something like that going. The problem is if you say just everybody can do whatever they want, um, what, who's going to volunteer and say, I want to clean the bathroom, okay? I, this is what I look forward to in life and I want to do it every day, at least 40 hours a week. Let me tell you something. My mother has been doing all the housework in my, in my parents' family for, the, for over 60 years. They've been married over 60 years, okay? In return, my dad makes better money, okay? Now that's like a barter system, okay? That's an agreement. However, I have to say my mom is not very happy about it. After over 60 years, she's very burnt out and angry about the housework. She won't totally admit that, but it's very obvious. But what I'm saying is you have to have a system where uh, the things that are less desirable are going to be things, you know, either you have to have some kind of a democratic workforce where everybody contributes some to the clean it, to cleaning toilet, everybody con contributes uh, 15 minutes a day toward the cleaning toilets or whatever. You can't just have these structures with nothing in them. There has to be decisions made, especially about undesirable choices. Um, and 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 also the issues about you know who's going to make the decision. So um, I advise it's a nice utopian ideal, but you, you gotta you gotta think it through a lot more. Thank you. Come on, John. Yeah, you know, I'm a Luddite. So if I use the first 10 seconds to breathe, uh, it's because breathing is good. Um, I, like, I like what you said about re resources have the real value and about responsible preservation of resources. Um, so I say my rebuttal with that in mind. Responsible preservation of our resources. Whatever issue is near and dear to our hearts, no matter where we're from or who we are or what amount of money we have in our wallet or don't or what amount of years we've been on the earth or we haven't, the planet, Mother Earth, is the foundation for all those other issues. So, uh, you know, when you think about climate change and being in a balance with Earth, that's gonna sound 
cuckoo crazy to a lot of people who think the United States is the most perfect government in the history. Oh. <laughs> John Lennon once said, imagine all mm -hmm. the people sharing all the world. Yeah. Now, when you're a kid, you know exactly Mm -hmm. That is who we really are. We are not bad, evil, jealous, ego-driven nutcases who are looking out to get a lot of money, and if a whole city of people has to starve every day for that, uh, that is not our natural state. And I'm sorry to say that although I love and admire and respect the people of the United States in our history, especially the abolitionist movement, and the yeah. suffragist movement, and the anti-Vietnam War movement, and the civil rights movement, and the environmental movement, uh, our government can F off. Mm -hmm. Because they don't share the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes I think Illinois, the I-L-L-I-N-O-I-S, stands for I'd love living in Norway or Iceland someday. Uh, now I say that because our government doesn't represent you, me, all of us. Not because I don't love seeing you every second of the day, because seeing you every second of the day knows that when you have tough times, as my family has had in the last month where my mom had a second stroke in two years, you have the strength to just breathe. Uh, I'd love living in Norway or Iceland someday, but until then, being here with all of you is something really good, and uh, the Zeitgeist Movement is imagining something that's never been there before. If they fail to imagine it specifically to our liking, fair enough, that's a good criticism. I've heard a lot of people starting a dialogue, and that's the beauty of America. We start dialogues. We don't go at each other in crazy chaos. Our voices, our ideas, and more importantly, our ideas are we dias. Happy St. Patrick's Day. All right. I'll keep it quick because I wasn't casual. Uh, I want to say that I really like the spirit of the presentation, even though I think that is a more dreaming than planning. Uh, but that doesn't mean that something like this cannot happen. And I, I want to let you know that in two months, on May 19th, I will be giving a presentation on a new political party, the International Logic Party. And I'm confident that through this party and the system, we're actually going to be able to achieve something very similar to this vision, although not quite the same. I think I still need to square up with you. We got it. Don't worry. Well, I just want to take a moment to thank our speaker for a nice presentation there. I'd like to come back again, the other Zeitgeisters. Um, the only thing I want to say is, um, regarding communities, um, hundreds of years ago, in feudal times, everything that a community needed was supplied within that community. I, I don't know if that necessarily was regarded as a utopia. I mean, I lived in a, in a village, a small town in the mountains, and everything I needed was in that small town. We only had like one shoe store and one grocery and one insurance agent and one dentist. It was a, I don't know if that was a utopia. What happened was the economies of the world about 200 years ago, and I'm a little biased because I'm a railroad man, but they invented something, and this far surpassed what water transportation, but rail transportation opened up the world. Yes. And you could get goods, and particularly the sharing of foodstuffs, without this locality uh, handicap. And it changed things radically. There's a train every day that brings uh, oranges from Florida up to the East Coast to the rest of the country. That's how we do it today. We're not going to grow these locally anymore. It, it's the, the concept, we're not going backwards to local economies, oh, really? like in the Middle Ages or something like that. Anyhow, thank you very much. I'm just to All right, now you had it. Yeah. We've got enough time just, now. Just for, uh, I want to show uh, you one thing. 15 seconds. Make yeah, it well, you need that. Well, well, uh, uh, anybody know that 10% of the world's population eats up 90% of its resources. That's what it is under capitalism. And we can, if we had socialism, which is a rational system, we can overcome that. Yeah. Baloney! Baloney! Baloney. 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 Baloney.
give a hand uh, to our speaker. He's going to get the last word. Get the last word. I'd like to make uh, one uh, because of tonight's talk. I'm going to make a short list. Uh, on on uh, April 7th, when I give my talk, I'm going to hand out a printed list of the things he talked about here that everybody's saying impossible. They are happening in various places around the world. There's a Mondragon experiment uh, uh, cooperative uh, somewhere in Spain, I think, and there's others. There are cooperatives that are very much like and, and cooperative factories where the workers decide and they have much better wages and everything else. And, you know, a lot of these bits and pieces that are in the Zeitgeist movement are already in existence all over the planet. So for all of you who sit up here and said, that'll never happen, that'll never happen, that'll never happen. They said the same thing in 1988 when Avery Lovins was traveling around the world. He was pointing out that people already had houses with no furnaces, $10 a month heating. People already had 100 mile per gallon cars where everybody else said, that'll never happen. So a lot of this is happening. Uh, can I have your attention, please? Who would like to have the speaker come back and give a presentation on how to implement all this? Last word here. Yeah, okay. Oh my God! Six minutes. I can think of the president. Yes. It's. it's uh, we got to. We got to get you out of it. Right. Right. In fact, it's all. It's eight thirty. One week. Okay. Um, this isn't going to take that. I didn't have anything prepared for anything for that. But I. I am. Uh, I say overall. Um, I'm delighted. I'm delighted for three reasons. Uh, the first reason is, is that to my surprise, uh, there was a big turnout. I honestly thought because of St. Pat's Day that there was going to be a turnout. I expressed my concern to Charles uh, that nobody's going to show up, we're all going to be out partying. And it was a full house to the point where Charles was dragging out us to chairs. So I'm delighted because of the turnout. The second thing I'm happy about is that during the both the Q&A and the rebuttal, we got a full spectrum of feedback. Okay, all the way from this is horseshit, it will never work, to I hear everything you're saying and I'm behind it and I believe it can happen. And the third thing is the fact that you you know, you thought, I don't, maybe let's make a pause, I don't know, but if you're inviting me back, maybe we can focus more on some ideas mainly lifted out of Peter's book. I don't claim to be a genius in crystal balls right. at all, but, Jean, but uh, Peter has done a lot more research and maybe I can kind of focus on some of the things that are happening again. They're happening now. Open source is happening now. Localization is happening now even though Charles isn't behind it, you know, things like that. So. Uh, I am optimistic for the future. Thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry the presentation went a little over and we had technical difficulties and I'll be better prepared next time. And last but not least, anybody that didn't get one, be sure to grab a free DVD. Thank you very, very much. Why don't you reach behind us to the gavel, right behind you. Grab the gavel and just gavel us out. Or will it adjourn the College of Complexes? That wraps it for the College of Complexes for March 17th. Thank you. We're adjourned for the night. See you all next week.